Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three. I wonder why that's red colored. It's the Zoom H6. Okay, I'm going to set this up here and, and let it record. Hopefully it'll come out. I think I'm going to set another recorder up, all right, real quick, an online recorder, because I don't want to miss this. Oh, my God. Uh, okay, it looks good. How do you get that to save? You know, I got hacked last night. It was bad. Hold on a second. I just about got it. I guess we're both on here. Let me try to get myself off.
that I prepared for this. But instead of reading through those passages, I'm just going to have you guys, if you're interested in what those passages actually say, you can look on Facebook. I have I have notes that I posted this entire presentation plus the quotations to give it the context. If you want to see what it, the quotations actually said, go on uh, Facebook to the notes and so that you will be able to see what it says. Because I had to take all those quotations out because otherwise this would have been well over two hours. So I was able to, by removing those quotations from this presentation, I was able to, I should be able to fit it down within one hour and 30 minutes or less. And so, all right, recording while you said, all right. So, let's see here. I'm going to begin. I'm going to begin in about two or three minutes. So at uh, 9:25. So one moment. Okay. All right, awesome. So I'm ready to begin. I hope you guys enjoy the presentation. I'm just going to be reading. I wrote this all out in a document. So I'm going to be reading it from the document. And again, you can read the quotations that I'm going to be omitting from this. Most of the quotations I'm omitting. I'm going to. I'm going to include a couple quotations, but otherwise, go on Facebook to see the quotations. So, I begin. There is a passage in the book of Deuteronomy which is very absurd in its present form. Unfortunately, the temple scroll did not preserve this passage since the ending of the scroll was not finished by the scribe. However, using a bit of reasoning, we can see the clear and undeniable facts of the matter. This passage has been majorly altered by the scribe, leading to a creation of a completely false basis of determining the rules for divorce and remarriage according to Torah pro protocol. I shall cite the passage in question. Deuteronomy chapter 24 reads, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her her, her certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, when she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detects, detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, who took her as his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. 
you'll notice this is a very, very insufficient law. It is so vague and ambiguous. What does some uncleanness mean? It really seems like this passage has been clipped and abbreviated, and thereby giving an appearance that divorce and remarriage is sanctioned, when in reality, the original facts of the matter couldn't be more far off. Allow me to illustrate using another passage of Deuteronomy which was preserved in the Temple Scroll, how it is almost certain that this passage has been condensed. So our copies of Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 22 to 23 read, And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, uh, and he be to be put to death, and now hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree. But thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Look at how insufficient this law is. It is so vague and ambiguous and leaves a lot of things completely unexplained. What sin of worthy of death deserves hanging on a tree? We are not told at all. But in a Temple Scroll version of Deuteronomy chapter 21, we see the following instead. If a man passes on information against his people or betrays his people to a foreign nation or does evil against his people, you shall, you shall hang him on a tree and he will die. On the evidence of two witnesses or on the evidence of three witnesses, he shall be put to death and they shall hang him on the tree. If it happens that a man has committed a capital offense and he escapes amongst the nations and curses his people and the children of Israel, he also you shall hang on the tree, and he will die. And their bodies shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed by God and man. Uh, God and man, that thy land be not defiled, which I give, which I give thee for an inheritance. So. You can see how a lot of words in that quotation from the Temple Scroll of the very same passage are not in our copies of Deuteronomy. It is so obvious when comparing the Temple Scroll to our copies of Deuteronomy that our copies have been abbreviated and clipped, and that the fuller laws about execution via hanging is more consistent with the character and integrity of the Torah and Yahuwah. Now seeing as how the Temple Scroll proves that this passage has been altered via abbreviation in clipping, it makes it much more plausible that the passage about divorce and remarriage has been clipped and abbreviated. It is very vague and ambiguous as to what uncleanness justifies a divorce, and it does not make clear why divorce and remarriage makes returning to a former marriage an abomination. Now then, I will demonstrate using other passages of scripture to illustrate the proof that what I am saying is true. Matthew chapter 19 reads, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And, said for, and he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whoever, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. His disciples say unto him, If the case of a man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For they there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be some, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Notice that the Pharisees, who were interested in justifying divorce and remarriage for any reason, sought to twist the law to justify their very 
lacks view of divorce and remarriage. If anyone would have justification to maintain the vague and ambiguous passage of the law about divorce and remarriage, it would be the Pharisees. Now consider, they ask him the question, is it lawful to divorce a wife for any reason a man wants to, as De Deuteronomy 24 seems to endorse due to its brief and ambiguous nature? As long as the woman finds no favor in the man's eyes and he finds in her something he considers unclean or undesirable, he can divorce her, right? Wrong, says the Messiah. Have you not read in the law that the two shall become one flesh? Therefore, what God has joined together, do not let men rent asunder by divorce. The Pharisees are not impressed. Do not let men rent asunder marriage by divorce. If what you say is true, what, uh, when, why then did Moses command a certificate for the purpose of divorcing a woman if divorcing a woman is forbidden? Now here is the key. Messiah answers them and says, From the beginning it was not so. Now consider, is he talking about the beginning of creation? Or is he talking about the law? The Pharisees refer to Deuteronomy 24 as the law of Moses sanctioning divorce and remarriage. But Yeshua, on the other hand, says, In the beginning it was not so. That is to say, in the beginning, it was not so that the law of Moses sanctioned divorce and marriage, remarriage. Rather, it was because of the hardness of the hearts of the Pharisee scribes who altered the law of Moses that now our copies of the law have Moses sanctioning or permitting divorce and remarriage. Their hardness of hearts corrupted Moses into a person who gave permission in the law to divorce and remarry. But in the beginning, it was not so that Moses gave permission in the law to divorce and remarry. Because of the hardness of their hearts, Moses permitted divorce and remarriage, but from the beginning it was not the case that Moses permitted divorce, except in very rare cases. Yeshua tells us that originally the law of Yeshua taught that any man who divorces his wife, except for fornication, and marries another, commits adultery, and that whoever marries the divorced wife that the first husband divorced also commits adultery with her. The Pharisees amongst his disciples then tell us that if it is the case that a man is stuck with his wife no matter what, even if she deserves to be divorced, it is better not to marry at all. Notice that they consider this a highly burdensome teaching that Yeshua was giving about marriage. So test other people's interpretations of Matthew chapter 19 and see if their interpretation matches the reaction of the Pharisee disciples. You see, if Yeshua was not teaching an extreme view about divorce and remarriage, being almost never allowed, then their reaction would be nonsensical. If, as he was, if he was teaching that a man cannot marry another woman until he gives her a certificate of divorce, the first wife, but once he gives her a certificate, then he is free to, to marry again someone else, the disciples would not have said, wow, if that is the case, it is better not even to marry anyone. That would have, uh, they would have said, oh, okay, that's not a big deal. I'll just file a paperwork, no biggie. But no, we don't see that. So you can see that people's interpretations of scripture are often nonsensical, but originate chiefly as a means of justifying sinful and lax understanding of scripture. Some men become eunuchs or sexless from the womb due to birth defects. Some men become eunuchs or sexless at the hands of men due to various surgical or barbarous methods of castration. And some men become eunuchs or sexless, not in a physical defect, but rather in celibacy and lack of marriage. Why do this? So that they will not be banned from the kingdom of eternal life, but rather they will that, that they suffer a life uh, without the joys of sex for the sake of gaining eternal life. Why should a life without sex sometimes be necessary for gaining eternal life because some people are not allowed to be married due to being divorced or because the people they want to marry are pagan or because they are not married and no one wants to marry them so and so instead of fornicating they choose to live righteously and honor their bodies in purity and holiness and as Yeshua said not everyone can receive this teaching only to those whom it has been given to be open-minded to the truth but to those interested in justifying sinful lifestyles and selfishness, they will not accept Yeshua's teaching, whereas the interpretations of others that all you have to do is give a certificate to finalize a divorce and then it's okay to marry again someone else, 
this is a teaching that is in no way burdensome at all. So it does not make sense for Yeshua to have said not everyone can accept this teaching if everyone can accept the teaching because of how easy it is. Now let's see what the Apostle Peter says in his preaching to us. He says, uh, it says, Then said Peter, The law of God was given by Moses without writing to seventy wise men to be handed down that the government might be carried on by succession. But after that Moses was taken up. It was written by someone, but not by Moses. For in the law itself it is written, And Moses died, and they buried him near the house of Peor. And no one knows his sepulchral, sepulchre to this day. But how could Moses write that Moses died? And whereas in the time after Moses, about 500 years or thereabouts, it is found lying in the temple which was built. And after about 500 years more, it is carried away. And being born from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, it is destroyed. And thus being written after Moses and often lost, even this shows the foreknowledge of Moses, because he, foreseeing its disappearance, did not write it. But those who wrote it, being convicted of ignorance through their not foreseeing its disappearance, or not prophets. So that's what Peter said. So I'm going to go through and analyze that. First, let's look at this passage. It's clear Peter is talking about the book of the law, the book of Deuteronomy. We are told here that the law was given by Moses to the elders, not through any writing of his own. Notice that in our copies of Deuteronomy, the entire book of Deuteronomy, the book of the law, is put into the mouth of Moses as if to say that Moses wrote the laws in the book of Deuteronomy. But in the temple scroll, Moses doesn't write a single law. Rather, to the contrary, it is Yahuwah who writes the entire book of the law. The only parts of the law that Moses wrote in the book of Deuteronomy are the parts outside of the book of the law, such as his speeches and his overview in Deuteronomy of the commands of Exodus chapters 20 to 23. Moses, however, the only laws from the book of Deuteronomy that he himself uh, gave were the ones he spoke to the people audibly. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have a scroll of a portion of the Temple Scroll, which came near the end of the book, in which Moses is told to speak to the people the laws. So notice he's told to speak the laws to them, not to write the laws down, since Yahuwah was the one who wrote the laws down in the Temple Scroll, not Moses. So notice that this passage found in the Dead Sea Scrolls confirms that God did not tell Moses to write anything. He told him to speak to the elders the law, and that the elders were to pass on the law to the people by teaching them themselves. Now, evidence that Moses did not write the book of Deuteronomy? Well, when you look at the very end in chapter 34, we see that the death of Moses is described, but of course it doesn't make sense for Moses to write about his own death as if it had already happened. It also says that since the day Moses died, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, it says, since the day Moses died, no prophet like Moses had arisen. This passage is clearly written long after Moses' day. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So now notice Peter in the passage quoted earlier. Um, um, Peter in the passage quoted earlier, the book of Deuteronomy was written by someone, but not by Moses. This shows that Peter rejects the current copies of Deuteronomy which have Moses as the author of the laws of Deuteronomy. For the temple school has Yahuwah, not Moses, being the one who writes the law for Moses. Moses was only a scribe of Yahuwah, copying what Yahuwah told him to write. But just like Paul's letters were written by other people who were his scribes, but Paul was the one who wrote or authored it, so also Yahuwah was the one who wrote or authored the temple school, but Moses was a scribe who wrote it down. Moses, having the foreknowledge of prophecy, knew that the temple scroll uh, that Yahuwah wrote would often be lost, and so he delivered the laws orally to the elders in order that they might not lose the laws even if and when the temple scroll would be lost. However, the someone that wrote the book of Deuteronomy, this someone was not Moses, as the book of Deuteronomy is a fabricated book written by a Samaritan, Whereas the true book of the law is the Temple Scroll, not the book of Deuteronomy, uh, again, which was written by Yahuwah and not by Moses. So, the someone that wrote the book of Deuteronomy, not foreseeing the, the disappearance of the laws in the Temple Scroll, did not think that making the book of Deuteronomy would cause the true book of law and the laws within it to be lost. But not having the ability of foresight and prophecy like Moses did, they did not pass on to their elders orally the laws of the Temple Scroll, the book of the law, as Moses 
had passed on those laws to his elders. And thus, in a short amount of time, the book of Deuteronomy replaced the original book of the law, the temple scroll, and the elders of Israel passed on oral laws which were based on the false book of Deuteronomy, not written by Moses, yet claiming to be written by Moses. Since in the original temple scroll it was Yahuwah and not Moses, who was the speaker for all the laws in Deuteronomy chapters 12 to 26, whereas in the false fabricated book of Deuteronomy, all the laws in Deuteronomy chapters 12 to 26 are put into the mouth of Moses. And so it was that the laws of the temple scroll became lost and hidden from the common people in this manner. We see also that he says, Peter says, the book of the law was lost multiple times often. He claims that the book of the law had been lost and was found in the time of King David, about 500 years after Moses died. Yet nowhere is this said in the Old Testament. However, it is said in the Damascus document. We are told in the Damascus document that, uh, this is a quotation now, the builders of the law who walk after law, the law it is which is oral, of which he said, assuredly they shall make it oral, are caught in two by fornication, taking two wives during their lifetime. But the fundamental principle of the creation, male and female created he them. And they who went into the ark, two and two went into the ark. And as to the prince it is written, he shall not multiply wives unto himself. But David read not in the book of the law that was sealed, which was in the ark. For it was not opened in Israel from the day of the death of Eleazar and Joshua and the elders who served Ashtoreth. And it was hidden and was not discovered until Zadok arose. Now they glorify the deeds of David, save only the blood of your Uriah, and God forgave him those. We see here that Peter agrees with the Damascus document that the book of the law was lost in the time of the judges after Joshua and Eliezer died, there being only one copy, the original manuscript locked up in the Ark of the Covenant, and it was forgotten that there was even a book of law inside the Ark of the Covenant, and that it was only discovered inside the Ark of the Covenant near the end of David's life when Zadok arose to the priesthood and brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Then we see also in the Old Testament that after the time of Solomon, the book of the law was lost once again. There still being only one copy, the original manuscript, locked up in the Ark of the Covenant. And it was forgotten that there was even the book of the law inside the Ark of the Covenant. And then in the time of Josiah, the book of the law was once again rediscovered in the temple inside the Ark of the Covenant. So we have Josiah writing copies of the temple scroll, book of the law. But all those copies, except one, were destroyed in the Babylonian siege against Israel and Jerusalem. So we see that Peter here once again agrees with something not taught in the Old Testament. Second Ezra uh, is the book which teaches us that all the scriptures had been lost, except one copy of each book, which had been sealed in a jar, and the scrolls had become melted inside the jar. Ezra prayed to God and that asked him to restore through him the scriptures, and God consented and had Ezra find the jar with the melted scrolls in it, and gave him the miraculous power to be able to read the scrolls and make afresh new copies for all the people. And that is why the Old Testament says that Ezra came with the book of the law. This is mentioned in Ezra chapter 7 verses 6 to 21 and Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 1 to 13. The notice in Nehemiah 8 that when Ezra brought the book of the law, to the people and read it, they wept when hearing it. Just like the same reaction we see with King Josiah when they found the book of the law and were hearing it for the first time. Now finally, once again, shortly after the second temple was built, the Samaritans wrote the book of Deuteronomy and then the book of Deuteronomy being much shorter and easier to copy and circulate and read amongst the public, and the temple scroll became popular in Israel. And the temple scroll was neglected and forgotten about by most people once again. 2 Maccabees chapter 2 verse 14 tells us that many of the books of scripture had been lost because of the warring against Israel, and that Judah Maccabee was the one who restored to the people the lost scriptures. So we see that Judah Maccabee was the one who rescued the temple scroll from being lost, and preserved it for the people, but still being neglected, and when once again the Jewish temple was destroyed and the Israelites sent to exile, most copies of all the scriptures written in Hebrew were destroyed, with the exception of the Old Testament which was preserved by Jews in other places, such as Egypt or Rome or various other nations, which, not living in Israel, not being persecuted by the Romans, were able to preserve those documents in Hebrew. Um, so all the scripture, most copies of all the scriptures written in Hebrew were destroyed, 
except the Old Testament, and except a few Hebrew copies of the extra scriptures that were buried or concealed in pri rare private copies that were unknown to the public. So with the Hebrew language dying out around that time, all those Hebrew scriptures that had not been translated into any other languages became lost because they had never been circulated outside of the land of Israel, but were confined to the land of Israel and were not translated into any languages for the common people to understand. And so once again, the Temple Scroll, the original book of the law, became lost. But in 1967 AD, after exactly 2,000 years since the Roman siege against Jerusalem had begun in 66 AD, so again, 2,000 years exactly later, when modern Israel ended the foreign occupation of Jerusalem by winning it back to Israel in the Six-Day War, in that same exact week of the Six-Day War, the Temple Scroll was recovered by the authorities of Israel. The Temple Scroll had been discovered in 1956, but it was on the black market until 11 years after, uh, 11 years after they regained it. Uh, in 1967, uh, during the Six-Day War, uh, in which they also regained Jerusalem. So can these things be coincidence? We have now once again found the Book of the Law that has been lost and hidden so many times. It is time for a great revival and return to the original law, the Temple Scroll, and to throw out the fake Book of Deuteronomy that is in our Bibles, put in the mouth of Moses, who supposedly was the author of Deuteronomy chapters 12 to 26. Those who wrote the book of Deuteronomy are convicted of their ignorance and their lack of divine inspiration, since the book of Deuteronomy in everyone's Bibles has many features which do not resonate as divinely inspired scripture, and since their version of the book of Deuteronomy has lost most of the laws that Moses had given us, as is confirmed in so many other witnesses uh, that testify to many other laws written in the book of the law, which are not written in our copies of Deuteronomy or even in the other books of the law, Genesis through Numbers. Now, we see that according to Peter in his preachings, the prophecy of the Messiah in Genesis chapter 49 verse 10 is authentic, which declares to us the Messiah, the ruler of Judah, would be a leader over us and ruler over us and lead us in the proper understanding and teaching of the law. And so Yeshua, being the prophesied Messiah, is the one to whom we should go to the proper understanding and teaching of the law. So then comes in Peter's preaching a, a, a key passage uh, Peter for supporting my premise about the passage about divorce and remarriage in Deuteronomy being abbreviated and clipped from a fuller version which explained clearly that divorce and remarriage is never allowed ever except for rare circumstances. Notice that Peter quotes Yeshua's teaching as uh, in, in this passage that I'm, you can find it on Facebook uh, as not knowing the true things of the scriptures. Our copies of the Gospels do not say this exactly, but say instead not knowing the Scriptures, but trusting Peter that this is what Yeshua said, we see more insight into Yeshua's teaching. The Sadducees believed that there was no life after death, and that the soul dies when the body dies. But Yeshua made it clear in saying to them, if you knew the true things of Scripture, you would know that the passages which appear to teach that the soul dies when the body dies, uh, and the, there is thus no consciousness in the afterlife in Shoal are falsehoods added to the scriptures by scribes and translators, further solidifying the fact that Yeshua was teaching that some falsehoods have entered into the law due to corruption of the scriptures, is that Yeshua says, if you knew the truths in the scriptures, you would know that angels do not marry. Nowhere in any of the scriptures of the Old Testament are we taught that angels do not marry. Yet the book of Enoch is the only book which claims to be scripture which teaches that very thing explicitly. It is in Enoch chapter 15 where it teaches that. So this confirms the understanding I quoted from uh, the Apostle Peter that Yeshua was faulting the Sadducees for their corrupt copies of the scriptures, not properly discerning which parts of the scriptures are true, Enoch and other passages of scripture they were ignorant or ignoring of, and which parts are false passages they appeal to for justification of the false doctrines of non-existence. He, he appeals to the Sadducees' own copies of scripture to show that Yahuwah is described as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How can he be the God of something that doesn't exist? So the fact that the scriptures teach that he is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob proves that rather than being the God of nothing, as the pagans would have us believe, he is the God of what exists 
that is, those who are still living even after death. The passages in the law, prophets, or other scriptures which appear to say otherwise are falsehoods contrary to the clear teachings of the scriptures elsewhere which declare in truth unambiguously the continued existence of the soul after death. The Apostle Peter also had told us in that passage quoted above that uh, earlier that Yeshua also spoke a saying which is not in our copies of the Gospels. But there are many independent witnesses, including other apocryphal writings and the earliest church fathers, which all quote this saying as being scriptural and divinely inspired and spoken by Yeshua himself. And that saying is the words, Be ye prudent money changers. Peter quotes that as a saying of Yeshua. So Peter gives us the interpretation, telling us that it is plain that money changers have to be able to distinguish between the real thing and the counterfeit passing for the real thing. And the counterfeit even being included amongst and being the bag, uh, excuse me, even being included amongst and inside the bag of authentic coins. So we see that Yeshua's teaching proves that there are some falsehoods in the scriptures which have been added by deceitful scribes who were seeking to pull the wool over people's eyes and deceive them with their scribal corruptions they put into the scriptures. These falsehoods usually not being passages added, but rather alteration of passages by abbreviating, clipping, or flat out removing or changing certain words to make a passage say something else other than what the fuller passage originally said. Peter also quotes for us another saying of Yeshua that, as far as I'm aware, is not in our copies of the scriptures. It is these words, Wherefore do ye not perceive that which is reasonable in the scriptures? So we see that Yeshua is saying, why do you not perceive the things which are reasonable in the scriptures? This is to imply that there are some things in the scriptures which are not reasonable and illogical and should thus be rejected as falsehoods added by the scribes into the scriptures. However, it is to be warned, as Peter often does warn us, we should not assume something is unreasonable unless we have absolute certainty and proof that it is illogical and unreasonable. The passage should not be rejected as false. And again, the unreasonable and illogical things in scripture are almost always due to bad translations or improper copying or alteration of the original Hebrew passages. So that when we see passages in Hebrew which have been interpreted to mean absurd things such as the idea that humans are born with a sin nature and that original sin exists, we can reject these teachings as unreasonable, illogical, and absurd and therefore not scriptural, but added to the Bible by the false pen of the scribe. And so we see, as Ju uh, Jeremiah warns us about the false pen of the scribe, the following, from chapter 8 of Jeremiah, it reads, How can you say we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribe certainly works falsehood. The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord, so what wisdom do they have? Therefore, I will give their wives to others, and their fields to those who will inherit them, because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. We see Jeremiah proves that the scribes copying the scriptures and the law of Moses have worked falsehoods into the scriptures by their deceitful and false scribal work, the false plan of the scribe. Because of this, everyone deals falsely, including the prophets. Now granted, the prophets in this passage are primarily intended by Jeremiah to refer to the prophets in Jeremiah's day. But it is also a valid understanding to consider the prophets that deal falsely as the copies of the prophets circulating amongst the Israelites in that time, which had many falsehoods in it, thereby making even the writings of the authentic prophets themselves deal falsely. Notice that the Apostle Peter, as quoted above, says uh, earlier, says, and his sending to the scribes and teachers of the existing scriptures as to those who knew the true things of the law that then was, is well known. Carefully words it. His sending to the scribes and teachers of the existing scriptures was the true law, but after the falsehood of the scribes, 
the law found in the existing scriptures that circulated amongst the common people, which, which then was, have any falsehoods. But that Yeshua appealed to the reasoning ability for to work from, and turned them to, to the true things in the law and the scripture. And discern which things in the scriptures are true and which things are falsehoods. And to be, as I quoted in the quotation on Facebook, uh, you'll see it on the Facebook note. Uh, Peter said at uh, he I'm thinking Oni got knocked off. But he'll be back on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me speaking? Well, I want, if you can, I want to let you know that I think that Onio's work is Lee I think you probably share this idea with me is probably some of the most important scriptural exegetical work certainly being done today he has no formal education at this it's something he has just pursued for the last many years and if you go back to his pursuits of a few years ago the stuff that he has is pretty silly but in that time he's become a legitimate voice I have not find a, found a way yet to get that out I'm working hard doing that now that I have this opportunity on Hebrew Nation Radio but I, I want you to know yeah, Lee says that we have talked at length that we need to protect what he's doing in the sense that we don't want a doctor so-and-so with a degree from um, um, Jesus Missionary College to get a hold of this stuff and mess it up and then sell it. You see what I mean? So we're working with him to get him the proper copyrights and to put these texts away in a vault. Who knows what's going to happen? All I can tell you is, I've been on top of this for a long time. And I've never seen research like this, especially from a young guy. Not only is it just research, but it's bringing out something that has never been considered before. Now, if you listen to the lecture from Rachel Elior, it's out on the veroyahad.org site on the scrolls page at the bottom. Rachel Elior is a guest professor on a scholarship to Chicago University which is one of the big places for consensus scholarship. When I say consensus, I mean they don't do much research except, okay, let me finish what I'm saying. They don't do research except in a consensus sense. She comes out, 
she lays the whole thing out with the gem in her speech that the sacred books are not what we have, but the sacred books have been compromised, yet have somehow come out of the ground. And the research he's doing goes beyond that. To put it in a nutshell, this is serious stuff. This is serious, groundbreaking, important stuff. And if there's any way that I could financially support him to get him in a place where he can do this without the hindrances that he has to deal with right now, well, we're going to work on that. That's how important this is. And only us folk here, us people who are not recognized by any scholarly community, are having the advantage of learning this. For us, the question is, what will we do with it? All right, I'm done. Can you guys hear me? All right. Um, I'm not exactly sure where we lost connection. Um, so um, let's see here. I'm just going to restart at one point. Um, wait, uh, so you guys heard me talk about Jeremiah, the corruption of uh, the false time of the scribe of Jeremiah, correct? Um, someone want to say if they, they heard me say that or not in the uh, comments below? or. Okay, so um, okay, so no, Peter the Apostle in his preaching says, and his sending to the scribes and teachers of the existing scriptures as to those who knew the true things of the law that then was is well known. Uh, so observe how he carefully words it, his sending to the scribes and teachers of the existing scriptures as to those who knew the true things of the law that then was. Peter is clearly saying that there was a law that once was the true law, but after the falsehood that described, the law found in the existing scriptures that circulated amongst the common people, which existed at that time, which then was, had many falsehoods. But that Yeshua appealed to the reasoning ability of the scribes and judges who had, uh, who only had those corrupt copies of the scriptures to work from, and turned them to the true things in the law and the scriptures in order that they could properly reason for themselves and discern which things in the scriptures are true and which things are false and to be dismissed as scribal corruptions or alterations. Now Peter says in the preaching also, and also that he said, I am not come to destroy the law, and yet that he appeared to be destroying it is the part of one intimating that the things which he destroyed did not belong to the law. And he's saying the heaven and the earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle shall not pass away from the law intimated that the things which pass away before the heaven and the earth do not belong to the law in reality. This passage clearly proves that Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 to 4 is very corrupt. For we see that according to Peter, Yeshua taught that he did not come to destroy the law, yet when he appeared to be contradicting the law with some of his teachings, he was not contradicting the law, but rather was opposing the falsehoods that were written into the law by the false ten of the scribes. And that is why when Yeshua opposes divorce and remarriage, it is clear he is condemning Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 to 4 in its current form as false and corrupt. Similarly, we also see that the law of Moses and the false copies that the scribes give us seem to endorse polygamy. There are many passages in the law of Moses which seem to imply that polygamy is not sin. 
so also in the books of the other scriptures. Yet Yeshua clearly and unambiguously condemned polygamy as adultery. This is only denied by people who are trying to justify the polygamous lifestyle as a very good thing, and so they twist Yeshua's clear word to support their lifestyle. I know personally, for I used to do the same thing when I used to be a supporter of polygamy. I was ignoring all the passages I knew, which to me seemed very much to condemn polygamy. But I twisted them to justify polygamy being very good and righteous and full of blessing. So how is it that Yeshua condemned polygamy, but that our copies of the law seem to imply polygamy is righteous and acceptable? It is because those parts of the law have been corrupted by the scribes and are falsehoods added into the text. Um, now, let us further go through the teaching, uh, teachings of the Apostle Peter to, um, together in his, in his preaching to see that Peter, uh, to see what Peter proves to us to be true in his preachings. Uh, this is quotation from Peter. For the scriptures have had joined to them many falsehoods against God on this account. The prophet Moses, having by the order of God delivered the law with the explanations to certain chosen, chosen men, some seventy in number, in order that they might also instruct such of the people as chose, after a little the written law had added to it certain falsehoods contrary to the law of God, who made the heaven and the earth, and all things in them, the wicked one having dared to work this for some righteous purpose. And this took place in reason and judgment, that those might be convicted who should dare to listen to the things written against God, and those who, through love towards him, should not only disbelieve the things spoken against him, but should not even endure to hear them at all, even if they should happen to be true, judging it much safer to incur damage with respect to religious faith than to live with an evil conscience on account of blasphemous words. So notice that we are told that originally that Moses delivered the book of the law, the temple scroll, that Yahuwah wrote, along with Moses' own explanations to the elders in order to instruct the people in the proper understanding and teaching of the law, but that afterwards the written law had added to it certain falsehoods of the scribes which was actually contrary to the law of God. This was done, as Peter says, through the inspirations of Satan, but the satanic inspired parts of scripture that were inserted by the scribes was permitted and planned by God to happen for a righteous purpose. It was for this reason to see when people were given the opportunity to make the law and the scriptures agree with whatever they wanted to believe, if they would be righteous and seek out the true intended meaning of the original scriptures uh, that the original scriptures had for us, or if they would seek out their own heart's desires instead. That is to say, because he values our free will, he could not prevent us from corrupting the scriptures. And so in order for us to have free will truly, he left it up to us how we preserve his words, and whether or not we seek his truth or not, and whether we keep his words pure, or if we add our own ideas into his words and corrupt his message so that it can support what we want to be true. Now even if it be true that inherently evil doctrines which are inherently against the nature of God were the truth, even then it is our duty and obligation to not believe anything evil that is contrary to God's nature of love, goodness, justice, and righteousness. Since we have no proof God is evil, we have no right to believe he is evil just because there are passages of scripture which represent him as doing or saying evil things. We are obligated to not believe anything evil about God, and to assume those are falsehoods, so that we do not blaspheme. And if we are wrong and God has indeed done or said such evil things, we will not be punished as wrongdoers because we were loyal to our Creator, and do not believe bad things about him when we had no proof. Just as we are commanded to not convict someone of a crime unless there are two or three reliable witnesses, and to accuse someone of a crime when there isn't any evidence they did wrong is being guilty of false witness. So that in order for us to not be guilty of false witness, we ought not to believe anything evil about God that anyone says, even if it is written in the scriptures. Now, this is not to say, as some people say, that we are justified for rejecting the righteous things of Scripture because we think they are unrighteous. Rather, Peter is talking not about merely what we believe is unrighteous blasphemies, but he is talking about justification for rejecting actual unrighteous blasphemous things that God, even if it happened to be true, that God's nature is that unrighteous and blasphemous. Uh, if you are wrong, something is blasphemous and unrighteous, you are wrong to reject it as blasphemous and unrighteous. And so if such a one is wrong that, that what he calls blasphemous and unrighteous is such, 
then he is not much safer, as someone might claim for themselves. We are only much safer if we reject actual unrighteous things about God, even if such unrighteous things happen to be the character and quality of God. As Peter the Apostle elsewhere says in his preaching, even if God was more wicked than could possibly be described or imagined, Peter would still worship and follow God's commandments and not believe unrighteous things about him, but would continue to believe only righteous things about him, for doing so is much, is much safer. For if you only believe righteous things about God's character, but you are wrong, then you will not be punished, or if you will be punished, it will not be harshly. But if God's character is not evil, and yet you believe evil things about his character, then you incur much more wrath and danger to your soul, and will be liable to much worse punishment. Peter plainly tells us that some portions of the scripture are falsehoods which were added to the scri uh, scriptures by scribal corruptions and alterations. Now Peter makes clear that this teaching about how horribly corrupted the scriptures are is not to be boldly taught to people publicly without a proper context first established. For if people hear randomly from the preachers that the scriptures are horribly corrupted, they will not trust the scriptures and run away from them and abandon the entire faith and religion of Yahuwah. We see this has happened many times. I myself have experienced this very thing happening to one of my former best friends named Sean, who was led away by false teachers such as Spiritual Babies and his friend Bobby. They have been led astray from all the scriptures because they were deceived by discovering how horribly corrupt, corrupted the scriptures were, but not having the proper context or explanation for how to deal with such a mess of things as the scriptures we have. Notice also that Peter says in the, the quotation that you can find on Facebook, that the multitude of portions of scripture are reliable and trustworthy, things spoken in the scriptures for God. But wicked, sinful men, overlooking the, multi the multitude of such things spoken in favor of God, having a righteous nature, instead focusing, uh, they focus on the obscure and rare passages which are corrupted, which speak against God and represent him as having an evil character. So we reject everything written or spoken about God that is evil, not for the sake of being popular, but rather for the sake of being righteous and loving God as he truly deserves, loving him in righteousness. Now for people who teach boldly without the correct context that the scriptures are horribly corrupt, they are causing the Gentiles to blaspheme, they themselves are blaspheming, and they are blatantly ignoring and rejecting Peter's warnings here, even though they accept these writings and preachings of Peter as authentic. Now, Clement then asks Peter, what are the falsehoods in scripture, and how one might be able to distinguish them? Let us look. Uh, so there's a very long passage I quoted on Facebook, you can find it. Uh, so I'm going to do an analysis of that passage. Uh, so Peter says, any passages would say there are more than one God are false. How is this the case? Because of false translation. The word El and Elohim do not literally mean God and gods, and so when the scribes translate them as God and gods, this is a scribal falsehood inserted into the text. There are passages which say that God sends lying spirits into people. This is false and simply not true. The lying spirits send themselves into people, and the people they enter. It is their fault for being wicked enough to open themselves to such spiritual possession. There are passages in scripture which make it look like God is ignorant of things. How can God be ignorant of things when God has the power to foretell anything? So it is the case that any passages which make God look ignorant are falsehoods by the scribes. Rather, it is not God who experiments in ignorance, but rather the Son of God, who is the physical manifestation of God, but is not God himself, God being without physical form. The same thing regarding changing purpose and using deliberation. All these things are falsely ascribed to God, when in reality, they are all descriptions of the Son of God, not God himself, Elohim being falsely translated God. Um, who envies? It is not God, but the Son of God who envies on God's behalf. For God himself is above all such care that it does not affect him whether or not we worship him. While he deserves to have us worship him, he doesn't experience feelings of jealousy or envy regarding his creation. He is above all such feelings, but the Son of God is not above such feelings, and experiences feelings of envy when his own creation does not worship him. It says in scripture that God hardens people's hearts, like Pharaoh's, but this is a false translation by the scribes. 
Instead, God does not harden people's hearts, but rather he exposes people's hearts and establishes in his sustaining power the choices people make, enabling them to make the free decisions to harden themselves. Is it God that makes people blind and deaf? It is not God, but rather it is the sins of people which make themselves blind and deaf. Now when a sin is done, and they are given the death penalty, the Torah tells us their blood shall be on their own heads. That is to say, although the judges are the ones that execute them, they are responsible for causing their own deaths. So similarly, judges or angels might cause blindness and deafness, but the disabilities people are being punished with are on their own heads. The scriptures say that God mocks people, but this is not the character of righteousness to mock. This must be a false translation of the scribes. No righteous individual would mock. The scriptures make it seem like God commands the Israelites to steal from others. This again is not so. But the scribal falsehoods in scripture make it seem like it is stealing, when in reality it is not stealing per se, but something such as taking back what is rightfully theirs, for example, or other various ideas of how it is not disputed that the thing is being taken away from others by God or the righteous, but rather what is false is the quality and integrity of the taking away that is being that is undergoing. The scriptures imply God is weak. In reality, this is a false scribal work. It is not God, but the Son of God who is weak. God, however, is not weak, but is omnipotent. The scriptures also present sometimes God as being unfair and unjust, saving sinners who don't deserve to be saved, for example or giving to others what they have no right to have, but giving it to them anyways, uh, but then depriving from others without any rhyme or reason. In other words, showing favoritism. But scripture says elsewhere, the righteous do not show favoritism, and neither does God. So the scribes have corrupted the passages, making it seem like God is unfair. But in reality, those passages originally did not describe him in such an unjust manner. All passages would suggest, for instance, that humans were born of a sin nature, and yet they are punished by God, be, uh, present God as unfair. These passages are bogus and altered and, and corrupted by the scribes. The scriptures say that God creates evil. See, for example, Isaiah, where he says, I create evil. But for God to create evil would be himself to do evil. So this is absurd, and we know this cannot possibly be true. This is clearly a falsehood inserted by the scribes in the scripture. It is I in that, in that day of the assembly. Via mistranslation. There are other passages where it says God does evil things, but these passages are again the same, mistranslation. There are places which say that God desires the fruitful hill. How can God desire anything? God is perfect and already has everything. He doesn't have any wants or needs that he doesn't already have perfectly satisfied. Desire implies a lack of what you desire. And so to desire something he already has is absurd. Now it is not God, but once again the Son of God who desires such things. When it says God dwells in confined physical places, such as a tabernacle, this is ridiculous. God does not dwell anywhere on earth in such a manner. God is everywhere at the same time, but he does not dwell anywhere. So this is a false translation. There are passages which make God look false, but this cannot be the case. The corruptions of passages make it look like God is false, but the original passages, God wasn't false, though he may have been a little deceptive. Since not all deception is lying, and some deception is in fact righteousness, uh, righteous because it is technically true and not false. When scripture says that God is fond of sacrifices, this is, does not make sense. Sacrifices have nothing to do with God's pleasure. God is pleased when we obey him and humble ourselves and deprive, deprive ourselves of good things we have if such a sacrifice is done for righteous reasons. But the sacrifices themselves, he has no use for. They do not make him giddy. It is the heart which makes him joyful. But again, if anyone enjoy, uh, if anyone enjoys sacrifices, it would be the Son of God. For the Son of God smells the sacrifices and enjoys the sacrifices. But even then, it is not the animals being slain that he enjoys, but rather he enjoys the pleasant things that derive from a righteous heart sacrificing. This is not to say, as some say, that God did not require sacrifices from us, because the scriptures are clear that he did. And there is nothing unrighteous about God requiring sacrifices. Rather, God did not command sacrifices because he desires sacrifices, but he commanded them solely and exclusively for our own benefit, and we are in need of them, not him. He is not in need of them in any way whatsoever. 
They are for our atonement, not his. They are for our hearts and not for his heart. Does God need lights for himself? No, the lights commanded in scripture have nothing to do with him needing lights, but it is for us in our own benefit. So that the scriptures which make it seem like all these sacrifices and priestly items are needed for God's glory and honor and assistance are false. It is not for his glory and honor and assistance that they were ordained, but for our own glory and honor and assistance that they were ordained. And does God abide in darkness and other things of chaos such as storms and smoke? How can this be when God is of the light and not of the darkness? God himself is the greatest light of all that lightens the entire universe. So it is certain God cannot be in any darkness, for God cast away the darkness. Does God love war? Some passages make it seem so, but those are false. God does not love war, but rather hates it and wishes it never needed to happen ever, and would much rather people win over their enemies with pacifistic means than with uh, bloodshed or animosity. Some scriptures make it seem like God breaks his promises, such as passages which seem to say the law is abolished, even though he promised many times that these things would abide forever, or at the very least until the end of the world. And yet Christians and others teach these things do not abide forever to the end of the world, but have been abolished. We know these are falsehoods added through scripture. Any passages which suggest God's promises have not been kept by him are absolutely false and disgusting scribal falsehoods added into the scripture by wicked scribes typically resulting from mistranslation or presumptive understanding of the passages that supposedly prove that God changed his mind and decided not to do what he promised to do. There are passages which say that God loves the wicked and adulterers and murderers. There are passages which, uh, these are passages which Christians love to cling to and appeal to them as justification that people don't have to stop sinning in order to be saved. But the fact is, God hates the wicked and does not love them, or at least does not love them in the sense that people claim. But these passages are most certainly false which suggest that we don't have to stop sinning to be saved. The scribes corrupted the passages by mistranslations. The scriptures say God changes his mind, but he absolutely does not, for it is impossible for God to do so. So this is scribal corruption, and rather it is talking about the Son of God, for the Son of God does change his mind many times. Scriptures suggest that evil men are among God's elect and chosen, but this is a corruption of scripture by the wicked scribes. These men are portrayed as evil men, but the fact is they are not evil, or if they were, they stopped being evil. But the Christians teach that all men are evil and sinful, and yet God chooses some and not others. But this is unrighteous in showing favoritism to some evil men and not others and gives no system or standard of true justice. And so we see that according to Peter, we, as seekers of the truth, must reject any and all things in the scriptures which say that God is not the only God and Lord, which say that God is not our Father, which say that the character of God is not good, which say that the character of God is not righteous, which say that God is not the Creator, which say that the character of God is not long-suffering and merciful, which say that God is not the Sustainer, which say that God is not the Benefactor, which say that, that God ordains things contrary to the love of men, which say that God does not counsel and require purity, which say that God is not immortal, which say that God does not make others mortal, uh, immortal, which say that God is comparable to other things, which say that God dwells somewhere else other than the souls of the good, which say that God is contained, which say that he has no limits, which say that God has not placed the world in the center of the universe, which say that God did not, did not and does not reign and oversee everything in the world, and any passages which say that those who sin will not be punished for their sins on Judgment Day. So all those, if Scripture says any of those things, uh, we are to reject those things. Uh, so having this guide at our disposal, it enables us to sufficiently understand the nature of the falsehoods that the scribes have inserted into the Scriptures via collection and alteration of passages. In another passage, Peter gives us an example of how the scriptures have been corrupted. If we just use the common sense reasoning we all have access to, that being logic, and if we reason out the implications, the men who wrote the books in the Bible, how were they able to know the truth of things they had no personal experience or knowledge of? It is through the power of prophecy and foresight. So then if the men who wrote the Bible had the power of prophecy and foresight, and they received this power of prophecy and foresight from God himself, to say that God does not have the power of prophecy and foresight makes no sense. So
So that any passage of the scripture which say that God is ignorant of things must of necessity be false. For God could easily, if he was ignorant of something, just use the power of prophecy and foresight he gave to men to know what he was ignorant of. So this alone proves that any passages which say God is ignorant are false and corruptions. It cannot be so. But rather, the Son of God, he is ignorant. That is the clear teaching of the scriptures. For in the New Testament we are told, no one knows about a day or hour when the Son of God will return. Not even the Son himself uh, knows, the Gospel in the New Testament says. But only the Father knows. So it's clear that God himself is not ignorant of anything. But we cannot say the same thing about the Son of God, who shows many times in Scripture his ignorance of some things. And according to the Scriptures, it was the Son of God being the angelic appearance of Yahuwah, which appeared to people in the Old Testament. And it is the angel of Yahuwah which is ignorant, and not God himself. Peter then, in the passage, cites the two sayings of Yeshua, the one which is not in our copies, be ye good money changers, and the other which is in our copies, but is slightly different in our copies, in which Peter tells us what he actually said was, ye do therefore err, not knowing the true things of the scriptures. Peter cites these to comment as proof that these are falsehoods and corruptions in the scriptures. And now here is a key thing that Peter says, which is very important. He tells us that Peter, uh, uh, he tells us that he is absolutely convinced, and with good reason, that nothing in the scriptures written against God or the righteous and just men recorded in the law of Moses are true. But rather, he takes the falsehoods in the law as impious imaginations. For uh, he takes it for granted, uh, the falsehoods in the law, um, uh, impious imaginations. For, for Peter is absolutely persuaded. It says that Adam was not fashioned to be a transgressor by God. Noah, who was found righteous above all the world, was not drunk. Abraham did not have three wives at the same time. Jacob did not associate with four wives, of whom two were sisters. Moses was not a murderer. And that Moses did not learn to judge from an idolatrous priest. He tells us that these things he will have to explain to Clement and the others some other time. But he never explains to them, at least in our copies of the preachings of Peter. But I am here to give the explanation that Peter gave them. It is absolutely amazing, this passage uh, that Peter speaks, because before I accepted this book of Peter as scripture, I believed almost the exact same thing Peter says in this passage, with the exception of his comments about polygamy. In other words, before I knew about this passage in this book, I was absolutely persuaded and convinced that Adam was not given a sinful nature by God, and that Noah was not drunk, and that Moses was not a murderer, and that Moses did not learn from an idolatrous priest. And I took for granted, just as Peter did, that these things are impious imaginations and falsehoods read into the scriptures by the scribes and sinful men. Now I shall go through each one and explain how it is such that these are falsehoods. Firstly, some passages of scripture imply that Adam was given a sinful nature after he sinned. And these passages are appealed to by lawless wicked Jews and Christians as justification for the blasphemous doctrine of original sin. We are also told in the law that Adam did not have the knowledge of good and evil, but that he had to sin in order to have the ability to distinguish between them and know the difference between good and evil. This is utterly absurd. The very idea is laughable. But so many people believe this about Adam. Yet it is clear that Adam had the knowledge of good and evil before he ate of the tree. So the passages in the law which imply that he did not, uh, that he did not have the knowledge of good and evil uh, are false. Rather, the tree of knowledge of good and evil did not give him the ability to know good and evil, as some teach, but rather it gave him an intimate familiarity with good and evil things or consequences. He experienced good sensations in that the fruit was pleasing to the taste and desirable to touch and look upon. But he experienced evil sensations in that he experienced the pain of horrible curses as a result of his willful and intentionally sinful rebellion and disobedience against God's righteous commandments. Uh, and in one other passage of Peter's preaching elsewhere, Peter says the exact same thing I just said. So he agreed with me. As to Noah being supposedly drunk, let us ask ourselves, why do the translators, the English translators, translate the Hebrew word in other passages not as drunk, but something else? As an example, in Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1, they translate in the King James Version as I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. Why do the translators translate here as drink abundantly instead of become drunk? 
if they were consistent, they should have translated it as drink, yea, become drunk, O beloved. Because it's the same Hebrew word. Yet they translate it as drink abundantly instead of become drunk. So it's clear that the translators know that uh, this does not always mean to become drunk, the Hebrew word. Another clear and striking example is Genesis chapter 43, verse 34. They translate it in the King James Version as follows. And they drank and were merry with him. We are seeing that the King James Version translators translated it as were merry with him. Whereas if they had translated it consistently, they would have said, and they drank and were drunk with him. But the translators clearly and correctly perceive that the word does not mean that they became drunk, but rather they were affected by the alcohol to the point of being tipsy or merry, but not to the point of being actually drunk. Most translations agree with the King James Version and say words to the effect of they were merry. The NIV and a few others translate as drank freely with him. We see the same thing in Solomon chapter 5 verse 1. Uh, most translations agree with the King James Version. However, when it comes to the passage in Genesis where Noah drank wine, they all, all the English translations, without fail, translate the Hebrew word as Noah got drunk. This is absurd. If the word can sometimes mean uh, not mean drunk, how can they assume that he was drunk when the passage does not clearly say so? We are told in the scriptures that Noah was a righteous and just man. And so we cannot believe that he did such a foolish and sinful thing unless we have clear evidence he did. And we simply do not. All we have is Noah drank a good amount of wine, enough to make him very sleepy, uh, sleepy, and he fell asleep naked without a covenant. Oh yes, simply because he slept naked must mean that he was drunk. I, I suppose you uh, have never been married, for you had, uh, for if you had, you would know married couples sleep naked in bed on occasion. And in general, even some unmarried people who are single sleep naked in bed by themselves. We are simply told that Noah drank wine, grew very tired and sleepy because of the wine he drank, and he was so tired he didn't even bother to clothe himself after he took off the clothes he had worn all day. To assume this means Noah is drunk is evil and unrighteous of us, and is one of the most blatant falsehoods in the scriptures that the scribes inserted into the text. To the contrary, the book of Noah, which was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, partially, in the book of Noah, it makes it clear that Noah was a righteous man and did not sin when he drank the wine. For Noah tells us in his own book, in his own words that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that when he, Noah, went to sleep naked after he had drunk that wine, he had a divinely inspired dream, vision. Think about this for a moment. Would God give a prophetic vision to someone after he had sinned by becoming drunk? It doesn't make sense. And Noah defends himself against him in his book, calling himself the righteous and just one. Therefore, def uh, thereby defending his moral character. It is clear that according to the book of Noah, which is more authoritative than the book of Genesis, that Noah was not drunk. And so when Ham mocked Noah, making fun of him for having so much wine that he was sleeping bare naked, fully expo exposed to whoever walked in the tent, uh, Ham was in the wrong. For Noah was a righteous man and did nothing wrong, and his sons protected their father and covered up his nakedness without looking upon it, and did not join Ham in condemning their father. As to Moses being a murderer, nowhere does it actually say Moses murdered anyone. He killed an Egyptian. However, our current copies of the scriptures make it seem like Moses was a murderer, because it has Moses looking both ways before killing the person and hiding his body. This makes it look premeditated killing, and thus murder. But this is a corruption of the scriptures. The scriptures we have are not a complete story and misrepresent what happened. Rather, Moses did not intend to kill the man, but some extra scriptures indicate to us that it was an accident. He was protecting his fellow Israelite, and he struck him with a papyrus scroll, and the man died. Now, uh, when it says he looked this way and that, it was not to make sure no one was there so that he could secretly kill the person, but rather it was he was looking to see if anyone was coming to help the Israelite being beaten, but no one was there to help. And so Moses took things into his own hands and struck the Egyptian with a scroll, and the Egyptian died. After the Egyptian died, Moses, as a rich man, took his body and buried him in the sand, but did not tell anyone about it, uh, hoping, since no one was, else was around, that no one had seen what just happened. Now, was this righteous of Moses to do so? The law of Moses commands city is a refuge for those who accidentally kill people. But Moses had no city of refuge. 
and it was probably the case in the eyes of the Egyptians, he would have been treated as a murderer, even if they knew it was an accident. So he had every right and justification to protect his life, especially considering he was an innocent man. Now, proof that Moses was not a murderer is that the letter of Hebrews in the New Testament says that Moses, when Pharaoh discovered that he killed the Egyptian, uh, Moses ran away from Pharaoh to escape being killed by him in faith. If Moses was a murderer, it would not be in faith to run away from the death penalty you deserve. It would be extreme cowardice. The fact that Hebrews says Moses ran away for his life in faith indicates that the author of Hebrews agreed with me and Peter that Moses was not a murderer. And so Moses fled from Egypt to a place, or in other words, a city of refuge, and he only came back after the Egyptian high priest died. Just as the law says, a man who has accidentally killed someone is not to leave a city of refuge until the high priest dies, and then he can return and go about freely without fear of being punished for the killing. As to Moses being given legal advice by an adulterous priest, this is not anywhere stated, but is a corruption of the scriptures. We are told that Jethro was a priest of Midian. Here is the problem with that idea. The Midian priesthood was idolatrous. So then this must mean that Jethro was a, a pagan priest, right? Wrong. We see that the word priest does not actually mean priest literally, and sometimes does not refer to priests in scripture, but rather refers to individuals who perform services of other kinds. See, for example, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 8, verse 18, where we are told David's sons were chief rulers, as the King James Version translates. Even though the Hebrew uses in that verse the word for priests, but clearly David's sons were not priests, since David was not of the line of the priests. Other trans translations, such as the NIV, falsely translate to say that David's sons were priests. Still other translations agree, however, with the King James Version in translating it as officers or chiefs rather than priests. So then, was Jethro a priest of Midian or a chief ruler or officer? It is plain evident that it necessarily must be that Jethro was not an idolatrous priest, as the corrupt passages uh, say he was a priest uh, of Midian. And so, and finally, to deal with the issue of polygamy. Firstly, was, uh, was Abraham married to three women at the same time? No, not according to scripture, for Jubilees tells us, chapter 19, And Abraham took to himself a third wife, and her name was Keturah, and from, uh, and from among the daughters of his household servants. For Hagar had died before Sarah. And she bare him six sons, Zimram, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua, in the two weeks of year. So notice that Jubilees clearly tells us Hagar was not the wife of Abraham. For it would not... Uh, for it would not have said that after Sarah died, he married another woman other than Hagar because Hagar had died. The fact that Jubilees tells us this detail about Hagar is proof, clear proof that Hagar was not the wife of Abraham, but only Sarah was. Then, after Sarah died, because Hagar was also dead, he took Keturah as a wife. This also proves Abraham was not a polygamist, for if he was married to both Abraham and Hagar, there would be no need for Jubilees to stress to us that both Sarah and Hagar were dead before he took another wife. Now, why does Genesis tell us that Hagar was the wife of Sarah? This is a false translation, or rather misunderstanding. For Hagar was a concubine, not an additional wife. According to the Hebrew language, the word for concubine means substitute or replacement. Hagar, as a concubine, did not become an additional wife of Abraham, but rather temporarily took the place of Sarah and acted as the wife of Abraham on behalf of Sarah. That is to say, the relationship of husband and wife sexually was transferred temporarily from Sarah to Hagar for the purpose of surrogacy. Hagar was only the wife of Abraham, insomuch that Hagar was legally Sarah for the duration of, the preg of her pregnancy, since Hagar had taken the place of Sarah and substituted her. It was Sarah alone that remained Abraham's actual wife, but just like a substitute teacher takes the place of the actual teacher, who is out sick or unable to perform her duties, but the substitute isn't an additional teacher of the class, and is immediately gone uh, once the teacher being substituted is able to resume her duties, so also the same happened with Sarah and Hagar. Sarah, unable to perform her duties of childbearing, hired a substitute wife to take her place, but the substitute wife was not an actual wife, and when Sarah was able to resume her duties of childbearing, Hagar was dismissed from her substitute duties. There are some who say concubines, taking a concubine is a sin, but this is not what scriptures teach, and there is no righteous reason to dismiss the legitimacy of, of concubines when understood in the proper context 
of righteous and monogamous marriage and the proper protocol that the law requires for taking a concubine. We see in Leviticus chapter 18 that the Masoretic Hebrew version most people use says it is a sin to take a wife to her sister, as if to say that it is okay to have two sisters as your wife so long as you don't have sex with both of them at the same time. That is how some interpret the passage anyways, based on the word to in the Hebrew. But in the Samaritan Hebrew version most people don't use, it uses almost the same exact word, but instead of the word to, the Hebrew word in the Samaritan version that is used is the word above or over. So the original passage, according to the more authoritative and reliable version of the Torah that the Samaritans have, says a man is not to take a wife over or above her sister. It is clear, according to the Hebrew of the Samaritan version, that this passage of Leviticus is actually a condemnation of taking a sister wife, a wife over the sister. It is not condemning marrying two women that are sisters, as some teach. It is condemning taking a sister wife for yourself. This interpretation is confirmed in Deuteronomy in the Septuagint version. There is an extra curse which corresponds to Leviticus 18. One needs to ask, why does the Septuagint version in the book of Deuteronomy curse those who take the wife above her sister? Whereas the Masoretic Hebrew version everyone ha uh, uses has removed that curse. It is clear that whoever removed the curse in the Hebrew copies of Deut Deuteronomy removed it because they didn't agree with the curse of fine taking a sister wife. Many people appeal to King David as proof that polygamy is not a sin, but according to the original version of Torah that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Temple Scroll, what David did was explicitly condemned as a sin. The passage in the Temple Scroll reads, And this is the law for the king which shall be written for him by the priest. And a little bit later, And he shall not take a wife from among all the daughters of the Gentiles, but instead he shall take for himself a wife from the house of his father, from his father's family, and he shall take no other wife in addition to, to her, for she alone will be with him all the days of her life. And if she dies, he shall take for himself another from the house of his father, from his family. So we see it is clear, according to the Temple Scroll, that King David was wrong to do polygamy. First Kings chapter 15 says the following, however, about King David. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by setting up his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem, because David did what was right in the hands of the Lord and did not and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Why are we told that David did what was wrong in Hua's eyes his entire life, and did not turn aside from anything God commanded him, except his sins involving Uriah the Hittite? We see that, according to Yahuwah, David was considered righteous and blameless, yet we see clear examples in the scriptures of David doing wrong elsewhere. The most infamous example, perhaps, uh, would be when David took the census. The scriptures say that when, what David did was wrong and against the law, and even go so far as to call what David did a sin. Yet according to 1 Kings 15, David did not turn aside from what God commanded him when he took the census. How can this be possible? This is because as follows, David didn't know how to take a census according to the requirement of the law. So when David began doing a census in the wrong way, contrary to the law's requirements, David, although doing wrong and having to receive punishment from God for it, was not considered sinful or unrighteous for what he did because he did it in innocent ignorance. David was not a willful sinner, nor an intentional sinner, and nothing he was able to know was wrong he did, except the sins against Uriah the Hittite involving Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. That is why Acts chapter 17 verse 30 speaks of God overlooking the sins of ignorance, because they weren't considered evil or sinful for doing such wrongs contrary to the law, when their ignorance was beyond their control. They were only condemned for their ignorance when it was in their control not to be ignorant. Um, one second. Okay, so so then we can clearly see and understand why and how David's actions of polygamy could be condemned as unlawful and wrong, but David himself be considered blameless due to his ignorance he was unable to control. See, for example, Damascus document on this issue, which I'll quote it again. The builders of the law who walk after the law, the law it is which is oral, of which he said, assuredly they shall make it oral, are caught in two by fornication, taking two wives during their life. The fundamental principle of the creation, male and female, created he them. And they who went into the ark, two and two went into the ark. And as to the prince it is written, he shall not multiply wives unto himself. But David read not in the book of the law that was sealed, which was in the ark, for it was not opened in Israel from the day of the death of Eliezer and Joshua, and the elders who served Asherah. And it was hidden, and it was not discovered until Zadok arose. 
Now they glorified the deeds of David, said only the blood of Uriah, and God forgave him those. So we see that because uh, David did not have access to the book of the law, he had no way of knowing it was wrong for kings to have more than one wife. The writings of Paul, as well as the books of the law, yet the apostles wrote for us, the apostolic constitutions, tell us that a leader of the congregation is not allowed to have more than one wife, where the command of the leader is to be the husband of one wife. So we see that Paul and the apostles confirm what the temple scroll says about the king being allowed to have only one wife. But what of Jacob? There is clear evidence that Jacob did not think he was a polygamist. The most powerful and compelling evidence is that when Leah wanted to have sex with Jacob, she had to go through Rachel to get in bed with him. Now, ask most men if they want to have sex with their wives, most men would jump on the opportunity. Now, if Jacob truly believed that Leah was his wife, asking Rachel, uh, asking Rachel would be very silly. It would make much more sense to ask Jacob herself. The fact that Leah has to go through Rachel to get permission to sleep with Jacob implies that Jacob believed that only Rachel was his wife. This is confirmed in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs where we read an amazing passage. You can find that on Facebook in my notes. The passage tells us that according to Rachel, Leah was not Jacob's wife. This is an amazing statement and confirms the picture Genesis gives us, uh, gives for us. Jacob did not treat Leah as his own wife because he and Rachel were convinced that Leah was not a legitimate wife because she had married Jacob in deception. Therefore, the marriage must not have been binding, uh, they thought. However, Jacob had never divorced Leah because he thought he was never married to her. Uh, and so, because he loved Rachel rather than Leah, God, seeing Leah, the true wife of Jacob, not getting the love she deserved from Jacob, cursed Rachel with unbearingness. God wanted Jacob to love Leah as his true wife freely and without being forced to do it. But God was trying to give him signs that he was in the wrong. But he wasn't listening and paying attention. However, when Reuben brought mandrakes in from the field, again, this is what the passage of the Testament of the Four Patriarchs is telling us. When Reuben brought in the major mandrakes in from the field and Rachel stole them, she stole them from Reuben, just like how Leah stole Jacob from Rachel, uh, uh, Reuben was upset. And Leah came to Reuben to find out what was wrong. Why was he weeping? And Leah spoke harshly against Rachel for stealing the mandrakes from Reuben, as well as stealing from her Jacob after she and Jacob had first married. But Rachel said that it was nonsense, but that Leah is the one who stole Jacob from Rachel. Since Jacob was already betrothed to Rachel when he had been given Leah as a wife. But we see that this whole time, Rachel had been wanting sexual procreation with her husband Jacob, but was unable to get it. Uh, seeing the mandrakes and desiring them, Rachel was willing to give up the sexual procreation she desired to get the mandrakes instead. Giving up on having children, she instead chose the mandrakes for herself. In contrast, Leah was full of boasting and she did not admit to the wrong she did against Rachel by stealing Jacob from her. Leah stole Jacob from Rachel because she wanted to have children from Jacob. Issachar tells us in the passage, that his mother Rachel had stolen the mandrakes from Leah because she gave up on wanting to have children from Jacob and wanting to uh, wanting to have these major mandrakes in the place of children. Leah chose uh, excuse me uh, Leah chose to give the mandrakes to Rachel because she knew that if she gave Rachel the mandrakes, Rachel would give up on having children with Jacob. And so she arranged for the hire with the intention of pushing Rachel away from Jacob for good. When God saw this cruelty done to Rachel by Leah, God opened his heart for Rachel and gave her two children in punishment of Leah's desire to deprive her sister of children, and in reward of Rachel's humility and acceptance of her barrenness. And to top it off, the mandrakes Rachel received, she gave to God as a holy offering, in order to give everything back to him. This action of hers really impressed God and resulted in Rachel finally being given children. But so we see here, the fact is, this passage of scripture proves that Rachel and Jacob did not consider Leah to be the actual wife of Jacob. And because of this injustice, Jacob and Rachel were punished with Rachel uh, being made barren. It is clear that God did not approve of Jacob taking Rachel for a wife, because if he did, he would not have cursed Rachel for barrenness, for loving Rachel more than Leah. We see in the book of Jubilee the following, in chapter 36. And Leah, his wife, died in the fourth year of the second week of the 45th Jubilee. And he buried her in a double cave near Rebekah, his mother, to the left of the grave of Sarah, his father's mother. 
And all her sons and his sons came to mourn over Leah, his wife, with him, and to comfort him regarding her. For he was lamenting her, for he loved her exceedingly after Rachel, her sister, died. For she was perfect and upright in all her ways, and honored Jacob, and all the days that she lived with him, he, he did not hear from her mouth a harsh word. For she was gentle and peaceable and upright and honorable. And he remembered all her deeds, which she had done during her life, and he lamented her exceedingly. For he loved her with all his heart and with all his soul. Notice thus that it says that Jacob, uh, after Rachel died, Jacob started, started finally loving Leah exceedingly, because she was a righteous woman, and he finally gave Leah the love she deserved as his true wife. Another passage where our copies of the scriptures are false and say unrighteous things about unrighteous men, uh, excuse me, say unrighteous things about righteous men like Jacob are where it says in Genesis that Jacob lied and said that he was Esau. Jubilee does not have that lie, but words it differently. So Genesis 27 says, And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. And a little bit later, in verse 24, then he said, Are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. Jubilees, in that same passage for those two verses, says something very different. It says, And Jacob went in to his father and said, I am thy son. Not, I am thy son Esau. Uh, I have done according as thou badest me. Arise and sit and eat of that which I have caught, Father, that thy soul may bless me. And then a little bit later, And he said, Art thou my son Esau? And he said, I am thy son. I am thy son, instead of saying, I am. So that's a very different. So Genesis and Jubilees completely contradict each other. Genesis says Jacob lied and called himself Esau. Jubilees is very specific in what it says, and it has Jacob not saying he is Esau, but rather that he is his son. Either the scribes added the word Esau to, uh, to the book of Genesis, or else they translated it as Esau, when in reality it does not mean Esau. Uh, because the name Esau in Hebrew is actually a word that can be translated doer. So if the passage was translated as doer, the Hebrew word Esau, it would read as follows in Genesis. Jacob said to his father, I am your firstborn, the doer. I have done just as you have told me. And then a little bit later, then he said, Are you really my son, the doer? He said, I am. If this is the case, it would be obvious that Jacob didn't mean the doer as a word, but meant the doer as the name of his son, Esau. But because Jacob was playing on the double meaning of the Hebrew word, he was not lying when he said he was the Hebrew word Esau. And he did not lie when he said he was the firstborn either, since he had legally become the firstborn when he purchased that right from his brother Esau. So this is one of the many examples where scriptures had been corrupted to make it look like righteous men of scripture like Jacob were more sinful than they actually were. Now, back to the issue of divorce and remarriage. Yeshua clearly says in the Gospels that if a man divorces his wife and remarries, he commits adultery. And if any man marries a divorced woman, she also commits adultery. That is not made up by me, but that is word for word what Yeshua says in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But if that is the case, then when is divorce and remarriage okay? And why is divorce and remarriage, for most reasons, considered adultery? Why is it so wrong, according to the law in Yeshua? Now, uh, one, one second here. Uh, basically, uh, because I was delayed 10 minutes by the interruption of Jackson, uh, I am going to go just 10 minutes uh, more than I was originally planning. In other words, I'm going to go the full one hour and 30 minutes that I was intending to go. Uh, so hopefully that is okay with you guys. Um, so in ancient times, there was... Uh, so there's 10 minutes left to this presentation. We're right near the end. Uh, in ancient times, there was a book of scripture that was included as part of the New Testament. It was so influential and important, it was considered scripture by most of the early church fathers. And even those who rejected it as scripture, believed it should be read to all new believers to instruct them into what a true faith requires. This book is known as the Shepherd of Hermes. And it is one of the most righteous books I have ever read in my entire life. And in the Shepherd of Hermas, we are told uh, in the Fourth Commandment the reason why it is forbidden to remarry after divorce. And you can find the quotation in my notes on Facebook. Uh, we are told 
The reason it's forbidden to remarry after divorce is because reconciliation is still legally possible, even if it's unlikely they will, they will repent. We are told that if a wife commits adultery and does not repent, he not only can divorce her, but he is morally obligated to divorce her, or else he is an adulterer uh, for staying in the marriage with her. But, says the shepherd, even if she is divorced because she committed adultery, neither of them have any right to marry another person and are morally obligated to stay single. Why? Because, says the shepherd, reconciliation is still possible between them, technically and legally speaking, as long as they are both living. However, we are told that this opportunity for reconciliation is only to be given once, and that if they marry a second time to each other, only to divorce again a second time, reconciliation is no longer allowed between them. And so we can reason with our logical brains that God gave us that if the reason we are not allowed to divorce and remarry is for the purpose of reconciliation, if reconciliation is impossible, then remarriage is allowed. That is why the shepherd says later on in the same book that there is no sin for remarriage after the divorced spouse or spouse who divorced dies, uh, since they can no longer reconcile and restore the marriage. Similarly then, since Deuteronomy chapter 24 tells us that if a man, uh, if a woman marries another man after she is divorced, she is not allowed to return to her former husband, this means that if either of the two sinfully remarry someone else, thereby committing adultery, the marriage is now impossible to reconcile and restore since trying to do such is according to the law an abomination, as Deuteronomy chapter 24 states. So the spouse who was righteous and did not remarry is now free to remarry because reconciliation is impossible with the spouse that simply remarried. And the spouse uh, that adulterously remarried, as long as that spouse remains with that person in marriage that they that they married someone else, they are living in an adulterous marriage and are perpetually adulterous. This interpretation best supports and fits what Deuteronomy says. For why would it be an abomination to return to the former spouse? It only makes sense for it to be considered an abomination if divorce and remarriage was considered uh, uh, if divorce and abomination was unlawful. Because if it was not wrong to divorce and remarry, there would be nothing abominable about the wife who was divorced remarrying after the first husband divorced, uh, marrying another husband, and then getting divorced and returning to the first husband. The very fact of returning to the first husband is an abomination it implies that remarriage after divorce is an abomination. For there is no other reason possible for why divorcing a second husband and returning to a marriage with a former husband should be considered an abomination, if in fact the marriage is not adultery. We also see, amazingly, that the Shepherd of Thomas teaches what true righteousness is all about. We are not given unlimited chances for repentance until the day we die, as most people believe. To the contrary, the scriptures teach we are given only one chance for reconciliation with God. If after we reconcile with God and thus repent so as to be living, perfect, and righteous, if we, see it, if we sin again, we are never allowed to be reconciled with God ever again. That's what the Shepherd of Hermes teaches, and also other scriptures teach that as well. Um, according to Peter, we see first of all that only very few will find the truth about the scriptures, and most will be led astray by the falsehoods described in the Vatican scriptures. These falsehoods, we are told, were given for a righteous purpose to give people a chance to choose whether or not they want to know God with all their heart. If they can pass the tests of deception and falsehood that the scriptures prevent for us, they deserve to know God and be saved by him. We are told by uh, Peter that God does not save those who are ignorant of him and his righteousness, but that he does not heal them. Uh, uh, not because he does not want to heal them. On the contrary, he desires all to be healed by repentance. But rather, Peter says, he does not heal those who do not know God and his righteousness because it is not lawful for God to do that. It is unrighteous and lawless for God to heal those who do not know him and his righteousness because the good things are prepared for things uh, for those who are children of the kingdom and not outcasts who have rejected the kingdom and its ways and its rules. Uh, Peter is not saying, as some think, that the scriptures are unreliable. Rather, it is uh, saying in his preachings, Peter is saying, that if you want to use the scriptures to justify anything you want to, you can do so, because the scriptures have falsehoods in them added by the scribes, and these falsehoods can be twisted to support any doctrine you want to believe. To avoid this, however, 
all one needs to do is seek what true righteousness is with all their heart, and then they will never be led astray by the falsehood so as to twist them to support sinful doctrines. On the contrary, being led by the spirit of righteousness, they will be able to discern which parts are falsehoods in the scriptures and reject those parts in order to accept and follow alone the parts of scripture which are true and righteous. No one who inquires ungratefully into the scriptures, Peter says, can find the truth and unrighteous, uh, can find the truth and righteousness. But those who inquire gratefully and out of true love, these are the ones who will alone find the true or the whole truth and righteousness of the scriptures. We see that Peter warns us in his preaching that anyone who is led by false passages in the scripture uh, to believe evil things about God and his character will not be pardoned or forgiven for their sins unless they discover they were wrong about it and repent. Because we have within our nature the ability to know what is righteous and becoming of God and his character. And so if we ignore the natural ability God gave us to know what righteousness and godliness is, and if we cling to the false parts in Scripture to justify unrighteousness and ungodliness, we will be punished and condemned. Another passage is a discussion of Simon with Peter. And Simon concludes that because the Scriptures have contradictory passages, this means the Scriptures are evil and lead people astray to unrighteousness. But Peter says, no, the Scriptures do not lead people astray because it is never justified to do or believe anything evil just because the Scriptures say so. Rather, the scriptures bringing before us truth and falsehood. So, I do for this day life and death. Choose which day, uh, choose this day whom you will serve. Uh, choose life that you will live. Um, so, the scriptures bringing before us truth and falsehood expose the natures and qualities of our hearts. And those who seek out the righteous things in scripture, these freely choose for themselves righteousness. Whereas those who seek out the unrighteous things in Scripture, these freely choose for themselves unrighteousness. So that because we have the ability to know without a shadow of a doubt which parts of Scripture are righteous and true and which parts are unrighteous and false, if we are led astray to falsehoods and unrighteousness, it is not the Scripture's fault that we are that we sin, but it is our own fault for leading ourselves astray. Ultimately, no one and nothing is truly responsible for our own sins against ourselves. Uh, uh, except ourselves. And in another passage, Peter condemns those, uh, and this is the this is the final paragraph here, and this is the end of the presentation. And another, one other passage in the Ephesians of Peter, Peter condemns those who use the falsehoods in Scripture to teach that there will be no judgment for sinners and unrighteous people. For people supposing, Peter says, the falsehoods and errors described in certain Scriptures to be representative of the truth. They became evil and sinful, and do not know God and His righteousness because of their desire to justify themselves in their sin, so they don't have to stop sinning entirely. And that's what the Christians do uh, so often. Therefore, in the belief uh, that God pardons sinners without a reformation of their character from sinfulness to righteousness, these people become as sinful and wicked as the God that they believe the Scriptures teach. And again, Peter quotes his two favorite sayings of Yeshua on this subject of corruption and falsehoods in the scriptures. Uh, the ones I've mentioned before about the, the money changers and the true things in the scripture that the Sadducees did not know. Um, as to Simon's pretended astonishment at the very end of the quotation, and what he said about Peter, that Peter would never change his mind about these things, even if scripture or angels or prophets or teachers or priests or anyone was to preach it, and he implied that this is not fair, for if you are not open-minded to being wrong, then this is arrogant and foolish. So goes Simon's implied argument. But the fact is, Peter and the righteous, and I myself, would be open to anything being true, provided it is first proven without a shadow of a doubt, and is uh, that what is being asserted is righteous by nature, and not righteous by mere supposition of someone who is fallible and is able to lie and teach falsely about what righteousness actually is. So then, mere assertions and mere suppositions and mere speculations prove nothing. The only things which are demonstrated by nature to be true without a shadow of a doubt are to be trusted as righteous and true. So, uh, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, for those of you who find the family presentation very compelling, to get the full concept context of the quotations that I was alluding to but didn't include in this presentation, you can read them in the notes I provided on Facebook. You can read the notes 
the note in full and see the, the full quotations uh, to give you an understanding of, to show you this is what Peter said and then compare it to my analysis and see if my analysis matches with what Peter said or not. And then judge for yourselves. Peter leaves it to you. Judge for yourself what righteousness is in the scriptures. Is it righteous or is it unrighteous? And you are your own guide and your fate and your eternal uh, soul is in your hands. So the scriptures leave it to us. We gotta make the choice. So that's the end of the presentation. I hope you all enjoy it. And stay tuned for some more very compelling presentations in the future, hopefully. And if there's any questions, people can ask uh, in the comment, in the, in the, right here. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you can also ask questions on Facebook. Um, but yeah, so otherwise, uh, thank you again. If there's no more qu uh, questions, then I'll turn off my mic. And uh, um, so it looks like nothing people have. So, all right, shalom. Great job. A lot of meat in there. Wow. Good night, everybody. Catch you next time. Thank you for helping host, by the way.